right, welcome everybody today to EPSOS and to this presentation. This here is Chris Tyler, he's the Industrial Research Chair um, for the Open Source Technology for Emerging Platforms at Seneca College. Um, so Chris Tyler, a little bit about him, he's a researcher, professor, author, and open so source contributor with recent focus on open source software for emerging data center systems. He's worked on computers ranging from small embedded devices to large networks and mainframes. Um, his presentation today for you guys is the Data Center 2020, and you can take it away. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, I want to start off with an unusual premise, I am a time traveler. Um, let me expand that a little bit. Uh, CDOT Applied Research in Open Temporal Portation sent me here from uh, the near future. I'm not exactly sure when I started from. Um, somewhere between 2020 and 2025. Um, I know that because it was Android Werther that I had on my Google Nexus. They started using um, uh, football, you know, uh, Super Bowl style numbering after they Google 12, or Nexus 12, I think. But, uh, you know, if you thought that jet lag was bad, you should try time traveler's lag. It's really terrible and quite disorienting. There are some big changes in the data center between my time and yours. And uh, I want to talk about a few of those. Uh, sort of a retrospective on what, is, uh, what has happened in the intervening years. One of the biggest changes that we've had is the introduction of non-volatile memory in a big way. Non-volatile uh, dual inline memory modules. The name NVDIM stuck even though we have a lot of modules that are not honking big DIMMs anymore. Uh, the timeline for these changes, we saw um, special applications for NVDIMMs appear in about the 2015 time frame. The first devices were flashback DRAM. So you have on one memory module a dynamic uh, yeah, DRAM memory system. You've got typically on the back of that module flash memory usually double the capacity. If it's 8 gigs of RAM, you've got 16 gigs of flash to handle wear leveling and so forth. And then some very large capacitors down the side of that module. These are modules that, uh, that are available now. When you lose power, the capacitors have enough energy in them to allow the contents of the DRAM to be copied to flash. So it acts as a non-volatile memory, even though it is a perfectly volatile RAM. The data is copied to flash when the system is powered on. The data is copied from flash into DRAM. And you've got a recovery time there, you had a recovery time there of about one second per gig per DIM. So if you had a machine that had, let's say, four eight, eight gigabyte DIMMs uh, in parallel, then you'd have about an eight second startup time for the uh, uh, flash content recovery. In 2016, we started to see these glass-based uh, phase change memories. Um, they did have some DRAM caching on them, but the write speed was approaching flash and, and better near DRAM read speeds and got rid of the block erase that was present with flash. So we had a byte level uh, erasure capability. And then uh, 2019 and on, we started to get into other kinds of MEM resistors, uh, much higher density. We had write speeds that were approaching that of traditional DRAM. So some interesting pieces came from these developments. Uh, well, first off, they weren't always actually a DIM. As time progressed, we, uh, we had some alternatives, package on uh, chip, package on package pop, or package on chip POC and a very small form factor rectangular module uh, that became widely used. NVDIMMs as main memory though, this was the real turning point when storage and memory became the same thing. When it was no longer necessary to take your data and chunk it into blocks and put those blocks through some sort of serial bus or parallel bus out to some external storage device. And rather, you just wrote stuff to memory and expected that would be there permanently. 
big, big change in the way that we organize things. The block model was gone. Four kilobyte blocks, one kilobyte blocks, 200 and, or 512 byte sectors, that's, that was completely wiped out. Uh, some changes on the system boards and with CPUs became much more common to have high counts of memory slots on your motherboards instead of the four slots that existed previously. There's now 16, 32 slot systems. Physical address space was increased. Uh, previous generations of chips had 41, 42, 48, 49 uh, bit address space physically. That's uh, a limitation. That limits you to, anybody know off the top of your head what 48 bits of uh, physical address space limits you to? Every 10 bits is roughly 1,000. 2 to the 10th is 1,000, right? 1024. So 40 would be kilo, mega, giga, tera. And then, so that's 40 bits. And then 8 bits on top of that, 8 bits is 256, right? So 256 times tera, you're limited to 256 terabytes with a 48-bit physical address uh, space. That may not seem like much of a limitation uh, to you in 2014, but it eventually did become a limitation. Um, and in fact, we're not quite at the point where mobile devices uh, have more than that on them, but that's expected in about 10 years' time. Um, some other pieces here. Execute in place. It became necessary to uh, be able to execute directly from your storage device because your storage device was your memory device. So rather than load the program from storage into memory, which effectively became a memory to memory copy, it's simply a matter of mapping in the program and a data segment from some other area of memory for your particular process and then executing there. Your fix ups are done with copy on write style um, allocations and that's how uh, things like dynamic linking are performed now. Storage area networks. Instead of accessing a storage area network which would be as it was in the old days some kind of uh, disk controller with a giant pile of disks attached to it. A storage area network is um, communication with a machine that just has a lot of memory installed, a lot of the non-volatile memory. And the only reason you do that is when you want to share the storage across a bunch of systems. In fact, in a lot of cases now, we've got machines that are partly in a storage role and partly in a compute role and uh, are flexible between those two roles. A couple other implications of NVDIMMS as main memory. Uh, Interesting thing, software state is now maintained by default. It used to be a safe assumption that when you rebooted a machine, you were starting from scratch. There was nothing there, there was nothing in memory. That's no longer true. Since memory equals storage, when you reboot the machine, you're just restarting the CPU and all of the application state is still present. This has many, many different implications. Um, one of the best, one of the good implications is that deep sleep is really, really easy. You save the CPU state and you turn things off. That's it. Resuming, you turn the power back on, you restore the CPU registers, and you're back up. You've got less than a millisecond to go to sleep, less than a millisecond to fully wake up. It allows you to easily sleep parts of your data center. Software state being maintained by default, um, means that a reset or state loss has to be designed into your software. If you want to forget things, you have to write code so that you forget things. You have to make it actively purge memory, clear things out of memory, so that you forget the state of an application. Some more pieces. Software distribution has changed. We no longer ship a file because the entire meaning of files has changed. We now ship software in a sort of frozen, suspended execution state. So we've got the piece of software in an address range suspended, and that gets loaded into your combined memory and storage space, and then execution gets resumed. It can have a partially initialized uh, software state, 
and present some interesting challenges for software upgrading. We get into some interesting copy on write and snapshot models for, uh, for software uh, upgrading. How many of you use SSH? Um, how many of you use SSH with a passphrase? OK, the rest of you should be shot. <laughs> you expect that that's reasonably safe because it's volatile, right? If somebody steals your laptop and reboots it, your unlocked keys, which were in memory, are no longer there. If somebody hacks into your machine or accesses your file system remotely and steals your .ssh directory, you're safe because your keys are protected by the passphrase, which they don't have. But when your storage equals memory and it never goes away, your unlocked keys using the old style software are still present in memory when you reboot your machine. They're still present in memory when you go snooping through the file system or the storage of that machine. So there are pieces here that need to be managed differently. We've moved the storage of things like unlocked keys into a secure separate module because we want to be certain that that information is volatile and not rely, as we did in the old days, on the expectation that it would just happen to be volatile because that was sort of the default. Okay. How did open source play into this? Um, well, free and open source software played an uh, important role in paving the way with experiments uh, with this technology. The Linux Collaboration Summit 2013, which was last year in your time frame, uh, was a pivotal point in uh, the discussion and uh, implementation of this in the Linux kernel. Around 2018, the 4.9.0 kernel introduced uh, a new type of memory namespace, and we started to kill off the block model. We're still going to be decades before we entirely kill off the block model, but we're on the road to doing that. Any questions on NVDIMs? Yes? When you type LS, the early systems would be using block emulation, right? Later systems, we've got new namespacing, new, new naming semantics that replace the traditional file system semantics there. Yes, and you get, into, you get into some really odd situations with memory mapping where you're paging together different parts of memory. Uh, you get into things like um, starting additional processes and creating the data spaces for those processes reduces your available storage space. So you get into a number of interesting issues like that. Yes? Uh, are there still use cases for volatile memory, like it's fast caches or anything like that? Uh, volatile memory is as you saw with the, the glass-based phase change, still using cases like that. Um, but with the later MEM resistor stuff, uh, really you can gain volatility without any performance impact. So you know, why not? Except where you specifically want volatility. And then usually you're using static RAM. Absolutely. Garbage collection is a nightmare. And, and, and you know, you can, if you can inject bad code in, you know, from an attacker kind of point of view, it stays there. So right. You no have that nice, clean reboot to hopefully get rid of anything that was on disk. And this is why to use, to use non-volatile memory effectively uh, requires new models. You can't use their traditional file models well. As a transition stage, yes. But once you, once you really adopt it as your entire system memory being non-volatile, you need new models, you need new semantics, you need to uh, move beyond traditional file permissions and, and block allocation and, and those types of things. OK, SOC, systems on a chip, uh, became prevalent from each, uh, each side of the industry. The glue is gone. Northbridge, Southbridge, support chips, glue chips, they are, have been gone for quite a while. We're talking about almost all systems being a single chip, one chip per system, plus memory. 
The memory is not usually in there. The memory can be a package on package. It can be small modules off to the side. But that's basically all you've got. Uh, the, the physical interfaces uh, not integrated too much at the beginning because of power consumption and, and some constrictions there. But uh, they were increasingly integrated in the later years. We saw that, that really the, the last few support pieces, the amplifiers for your Ethernet, for SATA, for uh, video and so forth, uh, eventually disappeared there. So x86 and ARM. ARM was a, a leader in the SOC area, right? A lot of silicon vendors using ARM designs did a lot of heavy integration. Um, so we're ARM's down a little bit. ARM was at, what, 96, 98, 99 percent of the mobile market. Uh, they've lost a little bit. And that's probably good because you don't want a monoculture anywhere. Um, server space is closer. So we're, uh, how far back did I travel? Five or 10 years? Uh, we've got a situation where x86 is still uh, quite prevalent but maybe not dominant. And once again, we've got healthy competition there. We've got some significant uptake of ARM in the server space. SOCs paved the way for hyperscale. We went from dozens of machines in an equipment rack to a situation where we had hundreds of machines in one chassis in that equipment rack and thousands of machines in the entire equipment rack. So we have to, to get uh, hyperscale to work well, you need integrated fabrics. So by that, I mean this. You need to have the network integrated into the chassis. You cannot put 300 Ethernet jacks on the back of a 2U chassis. There's not space. So if you've got 300 SOCs in that cabinet, they need to be connected in a, at least a grid, and ideally, in a grid where you take the left and right sides of that grid and connect them together. And then you take the front and back sides of that grid and you twist them around and connect them together as well. You end up with a toroid mesh. And so you've got rapid communication between any of the nodes on that particular piece of fabric. Connections outside of the chassis, yes. We still use um, uh, external connections on top of rack switch. If you have 300 machines in a chassis, you do not want to install software on them from DVD or even Blu-ray. Uh, you don't want to manually install software on those machines at all. You need to be able to automate that, have it highly automated. This is not something that was new with hyperscale. It existed well before hyperscale, but it became increasingly important with the introduction of hyperscale. And so a management processor was put on each SOC. In addition to the application processors and the cores that would be doing the heavy lifting, there is a small core on there which manages the rest of the situation. It manages the boot process. It manages the allocation. It manages diagnostics for the rest of the device. Fail in place. 300 machines in a cabinet, 400 machines in a cabinet. If one fails, who cares? It's like a bad pixel on your display. Well, it might be annoying, but generally, who cares? Right? It's like a bad sector on your hard drive, back when we had hard drives. Who cares? Right? It's just something there that we route around. We skip over it. We adjust the toroid mess so that we miss that node. And we carry on as though the failure is not there. Once you get enough failures, once you've got 100 failures out of 400 in that cabinet, then maybe you do something about it, but not when you've got one or two or five nodes that are failing. Uh, small memory form factors became important. When you've got this kind of density, the size of your memory chips becomes significant. If you can do package on package, that's great. If you need a small module off to the side, then that works as well. But the size of the physical memory became a, quite an issue with hyperscale. So what's our hyperscale density in 2020 to 2015? Uh, 2,000 to 8,000 systems per rack. Depends on the thermal profile. It depends on what exactly those systems are intended to do, what you've got in there as far as co-processing units and so forth. 
Core count is in the 32 to 256 range. I think back in your time, systems were quad core, maybe octa core, and you were starting to see some announcements of 48 and 96 core systems. Um, I think Cavium was about to introduce a 96 core system back in your day. Um, so some interesting developments there. A rack still is about 15 kilowatts. That's um, 10 hair dryers blowing out the back of the cabinet. It's about the same as it's always been. It's just that the heat of those 10 hair dryers is uh, generated by a lot more systems. There's still a top of rack switch. So you're still occupying a spot there. They call it top of rack, whether it's the top or the bottom or the middle, doesn't matter. But you're still switching outside of the fabric within the chassis. You're still switching on some type of external switch. There's a strong move towards physicalization, a strong move towards physical cloud. Uh, cloud used to be done with virtualization. You used to create virtual machines on top of the physical machines so that you could pack in activity more densely, so that you could isolate activity between uh, two different domains and so forth. When you've got hyperscale class densities, you don't need the overhead of virtualization. You can simply assign different core or different numbers of systems to the task at hand without virtualizing. So for example, in a 400 system chassis where each of those systems is a, let's say, 32 core machine, you could allocate 120 to a particular task to finance. You could allocate 80 to web. You could allocate 60 to, I don't know, the experimental next version of your web software and so forth. Um, you're saving that, that significant overhead of virtualization. Uh, you're taking heavy advantage of the uh, configuration and management engine that exists on the SOC to do the control rather than a software hypervisor. The open source contribution to the move towards SOCs and hyperscale? Well, first off, open source made the ARM transition possible. Uh, if we had been using heavily proprietary software, it would have been very difficult to make the transition to ARM in the data center. But the fact that everybody across the board, the Googles, the Facebooks, the banks, the everybody, had a stack that was mostly based on open source, it allowed us to take that software, transition it over to ARM, and then the pain in bringing the custom pieces over was minimal. That was, that was key in making this transition possible. The open source also enabled the physicalization cloud experiments. Um, there was interest in this with um, uh, some of the proprietary vendors, but to be honest, the hypervisor is a lot less important when it's not doing anything. So uh, the fact that we could experiment with this, uh, and I think the early experiments were done with um, OpenStack uh, and some of their, uh, their early code, the ironic code base and so forth. For those arriving late, I'm a time traveler. Okay, any questions on SOCs? Yes? So you're saying that like, corporations will be going from virtual machines back to physical clouds. Uh, would you have a timeline for that? Uh, it's, it's a gradual transition. Uh, there's, there's always going to be space for um, uh, the virtual cloud. But I think the physicalization move isn't a move towards dedicated this machine always runs this software. It's to a very virtual, very cloud-like dynamic allocation of systems to task. Oh, okay, so it's just right. really a change like, of what virtual, like if you're a virtual machine like network um, administrator, it's just changing how you do things? Right, you know? instead, of, instead of firing up 20 nodes of VMs, using the management processes on the SOC, you fire up 20 physical nodes now, right? And you avoid the overhead that the hypervisor uh, creates. Yes? Yeah. So you see that for see going uh, physicalization, what about virtualization within that physicalization? 
certainly it's possible and it's possible to nest it to the point of, of usefulness or beyond that to the point of absurdity, um, <laughs> which people have always tried, right? Um, but for a lot of practical workloads, it just makes sense to, to run that physically on a machine or a number of machines sized to the workload at hand. Yes? You seem to be suggesting in rough numbers a 2,000% increase in the amount of CPU capability per kilowatt put in. Um, you know, if you, currently we have four cores going to 32 cores at the minimum, then you know, one machine to 300 machines in one box, right? That, that, that's the sort of factor you're talking about. Are we currently on anything like that curve? In a, 20, in a 2014 time frame, we are on the, the edge of an order of magnitude improvement. Oh, yeah. Um, transition, the transition from, the transition to ARM hyperscale gives you an order of magnitude right there. And then uh, improvements in terms of process node, in terms of there are some other technologies in the pipe that may offer probably another one to two orders of magnitude in due course. Yeah, so we're probably looking at, at that kind of density. That's pretty incredible in six, eight years. Yeah, I'm not quite sure when I yeah, left. I, 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 <laughs> okay, yes? Just, just one comment, you mentioned that uh, physical space within the, the box is becoming Challenge. Right. And, and you mentioned uh, packet stacking, etc. So I think uh, around 2020, it would be quite common to see chip stacking where you will thin down chips to below 50 micron the thickness and then you stack them up using through silicon BS, which will eliminate a lot of uh, delays within the system and also uh, reduce power requirements, etc. So I think at that point, it will be uh, pretty common and dominating. Which, which is a, a major leap forward in terms of density, but it's... it's density per uh, square millimeter of board space. Basically. Right. right. And it's, it's really taking the, the, some of the early package on package stuff and carrying it to its logical right. next, yeah, next step. Those long, lengthy connections when you are dealing with packet chips. Right. And dis distance and exiting the package are both enemies of power efficiency. So keeping the distance low and not exiting the package um, will help substantially with that. Uh, my colleague, Ralph Lissack, uh, from semiconductor background. <laughs> OK, networking. What's happened with networking? A few pieces here. Terabit is becoming standard. It's out there. It's a little bit on the high side. It's not what everybody's using yet. But it's present. We've got it. We made the transition from 10 gigabit, um, which was reasonably common in the 2014 time frame, uh, 40 gigabit, which was 40 gigabit and 100 gigabit, which was pretty rare and exotic in the 2014 time frame. Transition through that. Uh, through the 480 and the 768 steps. And the now exotic and expensive stuff is the one terabit stuff. But that's, that's coming down. One terabit external is pretty expensive. One terabit in your fabric is actually fairly, fairly common. Okay. Do you remember back uh, fiber optic interconnects were supposed to be a thing in the 80s? And then uh, for networking and so on. They were supposed to be a thing in the 90s. They were supposed to be a thing in the, the 2000s. And every time we came up with something for which we said, this is too fast for copper, we're going to need to do it on fiber, somebody figured out how to do it on copper, right? Every single time. Um, yeah, that, that's continued. But in order to do terabit, you need quad twin X which is a kind of bulky cable. So finally, finally, people are saying, yes, you can do this on copper, but it is such a pain in the neck 
that we're actually going to do fiber now. Um, so you can do it. But still, you've got local interconnects that are, are quad twin acts, as opposed to, let's say, the dual twin acts that you had with the SFP Plus direct attach back in the 2014 timeframe. But the cables were just too, you know, you wasn't flexible enough. It just a pain in the neck. So finally, uh, we're losing ground to fiber. Quad twin acts just too bulky. It restricted airflow, and there was a number of concerns there. Software-defined networking is pretty much standard. Um, runs in two spots. Runs on the hyperscale fabrics. So within the chassis, we've got some SDN stuff we've deployed there. We've got uh, also stuff running on open data plane switches. So your top of rack switch and your end of row switch and so forth um, are running some of the same code that's running on the fabric within your chassis. So you've got common code base, three levels of deployment there. Um, Software-defined networking, critical, absolutely critical for hyperscale security. If you've got that chassis with several hundred systems in it and you are allocating a bunch of those systems for something that's public facing and a bunch of those systems for something that needs to remain private, you can't have those on the same network, but they're on the same fabric. So that fabric must be partitioned. You must have a way of being absolutely certain that the two halves aren't going to talk to each other. But a toroid mesh is a pretty close to optimal way of connecting nodes with four interconnects each. If you partition badly and destroy your toroid mesh, you can decimate your performance. So it's important that your software, that your cloud management tools, your physical cloud management, and your software-defined networking work together to allocate the nodes in such a way that you maintain your network performance, that you don't decimate the performance because of a bad allocation, physical allocation pattern of nodes within the chassis. Okay. Software function virtualization. It was a big uh, hot buzzword back in 2014. Uh, led to the elimination of network appliances. Network appliances are pretty much gone. Um, so what do we have in place? Instead of a, a router or a spam filter or a intrusion detection system or a, a high-speed VPN box, you now have generic network boxes. They've got a high-speed, very high-speed uh, data plane. Um, Improved security because there could be a standardization that could be focused on separating network functions into their own containers. We don't use full virtualization, but we use containerized approach there. And we don't throw out hardware uh, except to upgrade capacity, right? You don't change your hardware to add features. You don't change your hardware to reassign uh, network roles. Forklift upgrades are really only done for capacity upgrading. Where did open source play into these changes? The SDN, SFV experiment, software-defined networking, and, soft, and NFV, typo. Uh, network function virtualization stuff um, were basically powered by open source. That enabled those experiments. Open source provides a standard base uh, on which the containerized features, the intrusion detection, spam filtering, all the other network features are provided. And hardware vendors are using uh, data plane performance and scalability as their differentiation, not so much the, the, hard, the software pieces. You can buy fairly standard containerized modules, run them on switches from a number of different vendors, and it's the performance and, and price points that uh, differentiate the products between the vendors. Questions on networking before we go on? Oh, what happened to wireless? Yes. Um, so focusing more on data center stuff here, wireless got, wireless got interesting. Um, back, in, back in your time, uh, Nokia network division, because they sold off their phones to someone else, Nokia's network division was planning uh, for 2017 to deliver a gigabyte of data to each subscriber every day. 
365 gigs of data to each phone each year. And they exceeded that. So we've got a situation now where we've got multiple gigabytes per hour streaming down to our devices. And obviously, the devices are a lot more capable. You need a lot more storage, a lot more processing power in your pocket to handle the, that kind of data. But what's consuming that data? Well, video to some extent. It's, we still have YouTube in 4K. Um, but the other piece that, that's consuming that is intelligent uh, assistance, right? A software that's screening stuff, that's, that's searching for stuff actively for you in advance of you needing it. So before you need that information, your phone is, is grabbing it, filtering it, sorting it, getting it ready for you, compiling it. You saw some of the early experiments with that, with um, card-based systems, with uh, Google Glass, with um, Google Inbox, some of those types of things. Yes? Uh, with your systems becoming so much more concentrated from a 2014 point of view, how about malicious attacks to, uh, of your network? Doesn't that have a higher impact? Like, yeah. That sounds very scary from 2014. Yeah. <laughs> um, what can I say? You live more of your life online? You've got a, a greater personal uh, attack surface, right? And, and so that's something that's, it's a challenge. It's a big challenge. Um, and probably an, an, an excellent area of focus uh, for working between now and then. Scam will not go away by 2020. Oh, don't get me started. <laughs> okay, open compute. The 21-inch rack, which was uh, proposed as a replacement for the 19-inch rack, uh, has actually gained traction. Does anybody know where the 19-inch rack came from? Audio, professional audio. Uh, professional audio. Before professional audio. Telephone. Telephone. Before telephone. <laughs> no, before <laughs> telephone. <laughs> <laughs> Railway switching systems for the lights to signal trains back in the 1800s. We are still, in 2014, using stuff that was designed for trains a century ago. This is not the optimal form factor for digital equipment. Now. Facebook and some of the others that participated in the Open Compute Project realized that a 19-inch rack with the ears and so forth actually is consuming 24 inches of space. They said, let's reduce the waste on each side. Let's reduce it from 2.5 inches to 1.5 inches. Uh, so let's go from 24 inches worth 19-inch usable to 24 <laughs> inches with 21-inch usable. And that form factor has caught on. 19-inch stuff. Still out there. There's still a market for it. It's going to take a while to disappear. 21 inch has caught on because for a new installation, you can get significantly more equipment without taking uh, physically more space. The 208 volt triphase AC power that was proposed by the um, uh, Open Compute Project took off. So that became pretty much the AC standard. 12 volt power on solid power buses running down the sides of the rack, uh, either with a single power conversion from the 208 volt AC into 12 volt DC, or the rack divided into multiple zones with a power conversion unit at three different points in the rack, um, became quite, uh, quite common. Something that was heavily promoted by Open Compute, which was caseless systems, using sleds, using chassis that are, are open and not nicely enclosed in a box. Uh, again, became standard in the data center. There's no point having a pretty box that nobody is going to ever look at. And if you're doing your data center right, especially if you're using hyperscale and fail in place and so forth, you rarely, if ever, have to go and look at that box. It's better for airflow, it's better for the environment, it's better for cost if you skip that steel case around the chassis and just have a bare sled that slides into the rack. So that has become very common. 
Disaggregated rack, something that was really talked about and hyped and people were excited about, disappeared. This is a one hit wonder. So disaggregated rack was the concept that you would have sleds, trays of compute, that you'd have sleds of RAM, and you'd have sleds of disk. And these could be plugged into different parts of your rack, and they would communicate over a high speed interconnect. And the fabulous part of that concept was that you could upgrade them on different cycles. You could move from, from DDR3 to DDR4 to DDR5 RAM um, at your convenience when it was economically appropriate to do so. You could upgrade your compute as it became economically appropriate to do so or as your compute needs changed. That you could update your disk as your disk wore out, either the NVRAM uh, sorry, the flash or the uh, physical disk uh, wore out and became too brittle. This was a good idea that relied on a really, really, really high speed interconnect. And the only way to do high speed interconnect over those kind of distances from the top of the rack to the bottom of the rack reasonably was using photonics, right? Using optical stuff that's integrated right into the chips. Intel was ecstatic about this technology. They were really excited about it because they'd had photonics sitting on the shelf for the two decades prior. And finally, their solution in search of a problem had a place, uh, but the rest of the industry yawned and disaggregated rack pretty much disappeared. The drive towards non-volatile main system memory was part of it. It didn't make sense to disaggregate the storage and the memory. Uh, and then the realization that increasing the distance and exiting the package uh, both increased your energy consumption just made this uh, really a non-starter. So open source, how did open source figure into open compute? Well, the open source on the software side inspired open hardware. It inspired the opening of the standards uh, upon which the open compute compute platform was built. So here was one of, one of the first extensions of the open source concepts um, beyond software in a fairly big way. Open source also provided the key firmware standardization that was necessary for open compute to really uh, gain a solid foothold. Any questions on this part? OK, so what do you see when you walk into a data center now? You'll see racks and racks of equipment, 24 inches from the edge of one rack to the edge of the next rack, 21 inches of open trays of systems. Each of those trays has SOC-based computers. Those SOC-based computers, several hundreds of them on a tray, has integrated non-volatile memory for both storage and memory purposes. You've got high-speed interconnect out the back. Uh, it's networking at the terabit or fractional terabit level. It's optical, finally. All of this is powered by DC 12-volt power buses, uh, solid, uh, typically solid copper buses up the side of the rack, powered from a 208-volt AC conversion system. Overall, what's the impact here? Well, we've gone from having a third to half the planet connected to the internet to a situation where we've got, finally, the majority of the planet connected uh, to the internet. We've been able to do that without taking thousands of additional hectares of land to build new data centers. We've done that without building new nuclear reactors to increase uh, to power the, the new back end to the mobile internet. And we've done that without significantly um, damaging the environment, which we would have done if we had taken 2014 technology and just multiplied it by a factor of three or five or 10. Yes, question. I wanted to ask, how did you stop the software developers from outpacing the hardware growth? Well, there's, there's always been this question of whether the software developers really do outpace the hardware growth. There's a reason 
There's a reason that hardware, that the chip manufacturers have software divisions that think up advanced uses for their chips. And it's not that those advanced uses won't eventually appear. It's that they want to accelerate the rate at which those, those things appear. That's why back in, in the 90s, Intel was pushing codecs heavily. If you recall, codecs for video were, were largely coming from, from Intel and some other uh, vendors in that space. So there's, there's always been this sort of uh, cat and mouse, you know, so software, hardware, you know, do we have hardware that will keep over the software needs? Do we have software to use the hardware capability that's, that's present there now? Um, I, I don't see that that's changed very much over the years. Any other questions? Yes? So there's, there's two factors, e even factors that were present back in, in the 2000s. You've got a desire and a, and a capability to put a lot of compute into your house. But you've also got just the massive overhead and pain in the neck factor uh, for doing so, right? You've, you've got a lot more maintenance. You've got to know what you're doing. Equipment breaks down, all that kind of stuff. So there's that, the pressure to move towards the cloud and not do that stuff yourself. And there's a pressure to, to do that yourself because you can do that. You can bring that stuff in-house. Data center um, decentralization outside of the home makes a lot more sense when you've got higher density, right? When you've got several thousand machines per rack and you can put in just one row of racks and have a serious amount of compute there, then you can start spreading that out. And that changes what happens on the network backbone. That changes the... the dynamics of data centralization, it changes disaster planning, it has you know, a lot of carry-on effects. Overall, that's fairly good for the environment from that perspective because your backbone doesn't have to be as big, your energy consumption can be, uh, the energy consuming IT stuff can be located wherever power is produced. And as we move towards alternate sources of energy, small hydroelectric systems, solar panels, wind panels, we can put the compute you know, where that energy is being produced. Uh, so there's a lot of decentralization there. But decentralization into the house, um, yeah, there's pros and cons. I mean, you can do it, but the downside is you, you own both pieces when it breaks, right? All right, any others? Yes? Ah, excellent question. If you are 100 times as dense, does it cost you 100 times as much to, to put the rack there, right? And that is, that's obviously a, a huge question. If you, even if you paid the same amount of money for a rack that was 10 or 100 or 1,000 times as dense, you would win because you don't have as much real estate to, to buy. You have less energy consumption. And you've got less cooling to take care of. So it's a win in terms of total cost of ownership, even if the acquisition costs are exactly the same. But we would expect the acquisition costs to, to drop, not at the same scale. So you, you have an order of magnitude increase in density. You're probably going to look at a 50% reduction in acquisition costs. But your, your TCO, because of space, cooling, electricity, uh, you're going to you know, have more than a 50% reduction in your, in your total costs. Chris? Yes? Um, in 2020, who's going to own these data centers? Going to be private sector, governments? I, I, excellent question. I think the mix is very similar to the mix in, uh, in 2014. Governments. The NSA doesn't uh, use cloud, uh, external cloud vendors for a lot of the work because they don't want anybody else to be looking at what they're doing. Governments are always going to be like that, right? Very sensitive to privacy issues. They're going to run their own data centers for some things, 
But there are other things where they will just buy commercial cloud like everybody else does. Same with companies. Companies will continue to use commercial cloud. Commercial cloud will continue to grow. And like rent a space, as you have with Amazon and Google and so forth, that will obviously continue to grow. But there's still a point at which you say, I'm paying over and over and over again for this amount of compute. And it, and it varies. You know, I, I sometimes use this much compute. Sometimes I use this much compute. But why don't I take that amount of compute that I'm always using and bring that in-house? Right? If, if that's a big enough amount of compute, it will make sense to have that on private cloud and then overflow into an external provider's cloud when you need that extra capacity. All year long, your website uses this much compute. At Christmas, it uses that much compute. This is the part that you outsource. This is the part that you have in-house, because it's always uh, on demand. Yes? So you're saying that with, because we're able to condense all this, that um, other server types like enterprise and standard don't really exist anymore, then? It's just a data center because anyone can use it? You mean enterprise and standard in terms of? Um, I'm going with the, the Windows server layer additions. Oh, I remember Windows. <laughs> <laughs> I, but everything is all like, it's all just like straight up data center? It, whether it's big data center, which is a warehouse, or a small data center, which is a closet, it's the, it's the so, same okay, tech. So it's the same tech. Yeah. OK. I think we're, um, we're pretty much at the end of our time. I would be glad to talk with any of you afterwards if, you, uh, if you'd like. And here are my coordinates. One quick thing. I just like to... Thank you. I would like to thank Chris for his time travel. I know I'm feeling that jet lag a little bit. Uh, so thank you very much on behalf of everybody here for All presenting right. to us today. Thank you. You're